Mendham just made a video um, on resistance is ignorant and selfish. Um, okay, that's an interesting title and it's an interesting premise because I'm kind of saying that in a sense everything is ignorant really because we're going blind, we're moving blindly through the stream of becoming. Um, in a sense we are. Um, because even if we sort of take the conventional view of time, i.e. you're looking through the rear, rear window of a forward moving car and you're seeing events unfold this way, um, essentially a, would you call it, past centric view of time where you believe yourself to be part of some narrative, some mythology or something like that that is taking place, or you place yourself in, in, a, in such a mythology or such a narrative um, in order to cope with the present and the future, in order to not go insane when you stare into the stream of becoming, you, uh, make, you, you create an anchor that is based upon a, an interpretation or a categorization or a, I guess I would call it perhaps a, um, a narrative of the past. You say things worked this way in the past, so I'll project that past onto the future and try and navigate it that way, which strikes me as an effective way to navigate the present and the future, but it doesn't really establish any truths. It doesn't really tell you what's happening. You're just trying to get through the day, as it were. Now, I would call that a species of ignorance as well, um, because the past doesn't really exist in the sense that we understand existence, nor does the future. And if the past and the future don't exist because you can't see them anywhere, you can only project them from a vantage point that is neither past nor future, i.e. some vague fulcrum that is kind of, or I shouldn't say vague, but some fulcrum that's only vaguely understood. You know, some people would describe it as an eternal present or whatever. That's the way it's generally described in, you know, the Eastern way of looking at things. You're in an eternal present. There's only now. There's only existence itself. Um, now, this existence itself is, in a sense, a, a contrived ignorance if, if you accept the linear or the narrative view of time. Because um, you're deliberately blanking out what you believed at some point to be knowledge. Um, you're deliberately blanking out the past, or at least in terms of truth, um, in terms of the truth of it, to sort of see what truth, what reality actually is. And again, the assumption is, and I kind of agree with Zapfi on this, that if you actually see the truth for what it is, it might drive you insane or even kill you. So, <clears throat> unresistance to this might be ignorant and stupid from a certain perspective, but I would argue that it's very difficult in that context to do something that isn't ignorant. And in fact, it's acknowledging your own ignorance and it's acknowledging your own limitations as a human being. Know thyself. Know that ye are a man and not a god. Um, we, we only have the point of view that we have. We only have the tools that we have and the tools that we have are artifices that allow us to navigate things, but it doesn't mean that they're real. Um, just because I use numbers to, I don't know, the classic case, split the atom, doesn't mean that the decimal system exists. I haven't established any truth. I've just gotten a result. There's a difference. Again, it's the old thing when people draw a distinction between science and technology. Science is based upon truth. Technology is based upon results. Um... <clears throat> and selfish, okay. Unresistance is ignorance and ignorant and selfish, okay. Then I would like to sort of understand what a non-selfish act would be. How could you possibly do something that isn't selfish? How could you be sure that what you're doing isn't selfish? How do you know your own motives? How do you know why you do anything? 
if we say that un, un, unresistance is ignorance and self ignorant and selfish, okay, then show me a selfless thing to do. I don't think that such a thing exists, at least when we juxtapose it or contrast it with a selfish act. I find it very hard to imagine an act that doesn't in some way benefit somebody. Just take any act in any way, and you can spin a scenario in which somebody's going to benefit from it. Uh, by the same token, give me any act that anyone ever does, and I can spin it to make it look selfish. Or to even actually not make it look selfish, but make it actually selfish. In this way, it's selfish. Um, I don't know if I ever mentioned this. I took a theology course in university, and I asked a guy who wanted to be a missionary in this. I said, you know, are you doing this for your own edification, or are you doing it for their benefit? And, you know, kind of a nasty curb to throw at somebody, but I was a younger man, and I didn't quite grasp what I was doing messing with people's minds like that, I think. But I really threw the guy for a loop, and I hope he got over it. I never really... Because we had that discussion, and it, I seemed to be upsetting the guy. Um, so if people think that I'm annoying now. I've always been this way. I've always had the tendency to be a devil's advocate. Um, so you know, how do you how do you identify a selfless versus a selfish act? I don't know if you can. Um, nothing is absolute in one sense or another. You can say that in some ways, if we accept these assumptions, that's a selfish act. But in some ways, if we accept this different set of assumptions, it's a selfless act. It's not difficult to do that if you have a mind that's very used to switching perspectives all the time. Um, so, you know, you sort of go, okay, the Unresistance is ignorant and selfish. That doesn't make it any less futile. Um, uh, you know, and Mendham said, "Okay, you're appealing to futility," and I can say, "Well, perhaps yes, because if you're going to tell me not to be selfish, I want you to tell me how to be selfless." I don't think that can be done um, in a pure sense, even on a continuum. I'm not sure that you can be so certain. Um, and a fascinating story of that is. And it helps if you're a Catholic that's been sort of, or I would say a Catholic that's able to step out of their Catholicism, I suppose, the way I have, and or I think I have. <laughs> uh, when you look at the story, the messenger about somebody who, about Joan of Arc, who really wants to be moral, who really wants to be a good person, she gets carried away by this desire, and then her perspective is ruthlessly and rather brutally altered by somebody or something or a vision or whatever and suddenly <gasps> all this time I've been acting totally selfishly and I thought it was selfless now what's the clincher there? The clincher is of course guilt that this is your fault that you did this even though you thought you were doing the good and you were doing the bad or you might not have been doing anything you've just been creating mayhem everywhere and now look at you you know you thought that you, you were willing to go right to the wall in defense of your own principles and what you were doing was just creating a wreck um, you know, the, and that's that's an interesting way of looking at attempts to be selfless, uh, attempts to do the right thing. Why are you doing the right thing? Are you just being? Are you just trying to do the right thing because you want to look good in front of other people? You want to you want to give yourself a platform from which you can denounce the iniquities of other people. Um, you want always, you know, suspects that the grand denunciator really is denouncing other people to prove what a great guy he is. So I don't... Again, you can't prove this, though. But you can't... Any more than you can prove that what I'm doing is selfless. You can't say that what I'm doing... You can't show that somebody else is doing something selfish. But because the very act of pointing at them and saying that's a selfish person could be a selfish thing to do. So, you know, the assumption that selfless good, selfish bad is problematic at the very least... Which what act is selfish and what is selfless? <laughs> Good luck with that one. Um, or if if things are if you're if you're ignorant, what is non-ignorance? Um, what did Zappi's caveman actually see? 
What did he see when he opened his eyes to what was happening around him? What did Arjuna see when he saw Krishna's universal form? What does Plato's cave man see when he's tossed up into the bright light? How does he explain that to the other prisoners? What did, what did he actually see? Um, what does it mean to stare reality in the face? Uh, it was a fascinating um, comment on my previous video, something that I hadn't thought of, but it's one of those little, I don't know, they're colloquially called brain farts, I guess, that really tend to get me thinking. Um, what if our brains are mere filters? What if they don't create anything? They're just keeping out all the stuff that will overwhelm us the way Zafi's caveman was overwhelmed, or Plato's cave dweller would be overwhelmed if he's tossed out into the sun. What if it's just a filter to prevent us from going mad simply by preventing us from staring directly into the face of existence? Um, that's an interesting thought, and it kind of dovetails neatly with what I tend to think, and um, or I what I think dovetails neatly with that theory, I guess. Um, or it's also the the you know you can also look look at it the other way in terms of the idea of the herd versus the ubermensch or the herd versus the non-herd or whatever you want to say. Um, the herd needs its mythologies and its narratives and everything like that in order to avoid going insane. It needs its ignorance. Um, and in fact, it really gets angry when you challenge its deliberately inculcated ignorance or its deliberately inculcated sense of narrative, sense of anchoredness. Um, so yes, yeah, it's, it's possible that you, know, you can say that that's not necessarily a sane view of things. Phoenix Chastain and I were discussing what what really is sanity in this context. How can we really say that somebody is mad or not mad in this context? Um, we've all heard of the divine madman. Um, so, you know, there's plenty of that around uh, in the various mythologies of, you know, or I shouldn't say mythologies, but the various allegories of what it means to actually come awake and see reality for what it is. Um, so what is a non-lunatic? What is a sane person supposed to actually seem like? And who gets to decide? Um, who gets to decide what the fundamental under underlying reality of the situation is that those disagreeing with must be branded insane. Well, I would say that that's, that's the Grand Inquisitor who gets to do that in one form or another, or the head of the KGB, or the head of the Gestapo, or something like that. These are just people who say, this is reality, and anyone thinking otherwise is insane. Uh, simply wrong. And we can't let their wrongness be spread around. Um, What do you do with people who persist in their wrongness when you're the one who has decided that you get that you know what the truth is? We all know what heresy hunting looks like. Um, the um, you know, the, the another objection is it's like 99 people out of 100 would disagree with this point of view, and I don't I don't disagree with that statement. Nine and I people out of a hundred, and I'd say the proportion is probably higher, would, if they listen to this conversation or this monologue that I keep making, they would conclude that I'm insane. Now, I, I'm not worried about that. Um, I discuss this with whoever wants to listen, and people, I'm sure lots of people do conclude that I am. I don't care. Why should it matter to me? Is my existent, dependent upon what 99 out of 100 other people vote on. They, they, they tell me what I am. They get to tell me what correctness is and that I'm wrong and that the only way that I can find out what is true is by asking for the, the 99 people to tell me what it is. No, no way. I, I'm never going to do that. That's that's a lost hope. I'm going to get you know, thrown to the lions or burnt at the stake probably before I do that, and not because I'm a particularly brave person, or, but simply because I don't think that my mind is put together that way, or if I am actually broken in that regard, it would be more like Winston Smith finally being broken by the party in 1984. I just won't be the same person anymore. 
So you know, you you can you can force me to parrot the party line or whatever, but I, I can't see any way in which the herd could actually break me in any real sense and m remain myself. Um, so 99 people out of 100 will think that I'm insane if I tell them this, but 99 out of 100 people don't think that far. They don't look beyond the everyday. They don't look beyond Zapfi's anchors and his, you know, distractions and things like that. That's the nature of the herd, or that's the nature of Plato's cave dwellers, or that's the nature of non-awake people in a Buddhist context. The, Bu the Buddha, Buddha just means I'm the person who is awake. Okay, how many Buddhas are there kicking around in the world? There's not very many. Uh, you know, so just because you're awake and everybody else is asleep doesn't mean that you're wrong, simply because 99 of them say that you're wrong. Um, and it isn't it isn't that I that it doesn't matter what others feel when you sort of like this objection my name raised this objection or you just or I don't know if it was my name uh, somebody pointed out that you're sort of saying okay this is if you actually take the point of view that the 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 experience of becoming is all that we have you're indifferent to other people's sufferings. Well, it isn't really that I'm indifferent to other people's sufferings any more than they are indifferent to their own sufferings. Now, a lot of people have made a case that people don't understand how bad their lives really are. So I would say that if I'm indifferent to everybody else's sufferings, it's only because they're indifferent to their own sufferings, or they're, they're ignorant to it. They don't even know how they're suffering. As I say, in, in Benatar's own argument, he says that people don't grasp how, good, how bad their own lives are. Okay, if they don't grasp how bad their own lives are, how am I supposed to grasp how bad their own lives are, or care if they don't care? See what I'm saying? It's it, it's easy to sort of say that that that's not very nice of me to be indifferent to other people's sufferings, but by the same token, you have to take into consideration the admission inherent in a lot of this that almost everybody is indifferent or ignorant to their own low quality of existence. So you have to take these things as a whole. You have to sort of move forward, as it were, on a broad front, as opposed to just sort of dealing with thing, with arguments piecemeal, or otherwise you end up sort of going all over the place. You have to sort of look at it as a whole thing. Um, and you have to think about the, the implications of ignorance that has been deliberately inculcated. If I deliberately sort of... You know, if I sort of say, and I hear this so often, it's, you know, and I think people will believe me when I say this. Um, you think too much. You think too much, Andy. It's just, there's too much going on in your mind at all times. And, you know, you, you, you delve into things that most people simply couldn't care less about. All right. That's a choice on their part to sort of say, I'm not going to pursue that line of thinking. Um, so, in a sense they're complicit in their own situation in life. If they don't want to face the fact that their life might not be as good as they think it is, that's a big if. Um, then that's kind of their doing, not mine. So if I'm indifferent or ignorant of their sufferings, so are they. Um, should they feel bad about their own ignorance or indifference to their own sufferings? And chances are they are as just as indifferent to suffering, uh, the suffering of others, as I am. So who, do, who again, uh, handing out speeding tickets at the Indy 500? Like, if if I'm doing something wrong, who's who isn't, and who gets to decide? Um. So where again, it does seem to go right back to you're left with analyzing the brute reality of existence. And you have to say, what aspects of this can I control? What aspects of this are under my control? What aspects of this are determined? And what, what aspects of, of reality are, um, are receptive to my prohydrasis, my faculty of choice? Um, what can I choose? And what do I have control over? I would say that I don't really have control over somebody else's mental state who has deliberately ab ab abdicated control over it themselves. 
I overthink everything, according to them. Therefore, perhaps I can see clearly that their lives kind of suck from my point of view. But if they don't self-examine, and they choose not to self-examine to the way that I have, questioning all the nice things that everybody, all the nice images and narratives that people have, mythologies, if they don't question all of that, okay, then they've made a choice there. They made a choice not to self-examine. They've made, and, and I'm not going to argue with their with their choice. That's a choice. The thing is, I just won't accept any more of the blame than they should be afforded as well. If they're blind to their own position in the world or their the, their own existence, um, then I can hardly be expected to be um, not blind to it or receptive to it or responsible for it, let alone. Um, there was an interesting novella, The Death of Ivan Ilyich by uh, Tolstoy, where a man faces death and he suddenly realizes what an absolute and utter lie his whole existence was. Um, and it was only because he bought into everything. He believed in the great mythology, the great mythology, and he sort of also believed in punishing heretics. All that got stripped away from him when he became deathly ill and he had to face his own existence and he just didn't know what to do. Um, it's one of the more disturbing stories I've ever read and I've I've read it quite I read it quite young where I got almost all of it right away but I didn't quite grasp the the ending but it's fascinating it's a very good book about somebody who's you know it's it's a more sort of or a less mythological case of Zappi's caveman being thrust into the stream of reality without any warning death does that I suppose death is the ultimate sort of now you're going to see reality type thing. Now you can dispense with all the hooey, all the woo and all the rubbish. Now reality's coming. Um, and he was unprepared for it because he was hooked on his mythologies. It's like, well, you know, I always talk about that line from Jacob's Ladder where a guy is um, haunted by horrible images of death and destruction and disease and dying and agony and everything. And his quote-unquote guardian angel, who's just a human being, really, says to him, look, when you're afraid of dying, you'll see devils everywhere ripping your life away. But once you accept the fact that it's really out of your hands, those devils become angels. Because all that they're really doing, and this is kind of a Christian metaphor used, but I kind of think that it's apt. All that you're doing is, these, these devils are really just freeing your soul from attachments to the earth or to the world, or to your life, really. Attachments to your own personal existence at this point, which you always knew was going to be taken from you. Um, why, why did you get attached to something that you knew was finite, and very finite like that? Well, you put the idea out of your mind. You didn't want to think. You, you were one of the deliberately ignorant people, which most people are, so I'm not judging you for it. But it has a nasty effect at the end when your death is coming, because you get horrified by the idea of dying and you get horrified by the idea of having your your beliefs yanked violently away from you like that um, it's a, it is a terrifying thought I can imagine and I think that's what a lot of people my age are facing right now when they're dealing with their midlife existential crisis everything you thought was real is now being shown to be wow just a mythology when you were young you believed in it all uh, and now it's sort of being shown to be to have been a bit of a false hope. What do you make of that fact now that you all these anchors and distractions that you've got are suddenly being shown to be less and less effective as time goes by and you head to that precipice of uh, death? Well, you run up against a lot of horror, I think. And that deliberately inculcated in, uh, ignorance is being taken from people at that point. And I think a lot of anxiety that people have, just general anxiety in and of itself, is from that. It's they're sort of they're sort of going, okay, I'm going along with all this, but in some place or in some way, at at certain times, whatever, when I let my mind loose, I go, what is all this? What does it mean? You know what? What's the purpose of it all? You know, you, you you stop actually just being a drone on the assembly line, and you look up and you think about it all. 
Now what? Well, uh, per those who say that people don't know the quality of their own lives, most people don't do that. So it's not as though it doesn't matter what other people think. It's just I have no control over it, or it doesn't matter what other people, how other people feel, or what they're suffering, or whatever. Because contingent in that argument is the idea that most people don't even know their own sufferings. You can't have one without the other. And again, you get back to the old "I'm responsible" thing. I'm responsible for my own existence. I'm responsible for whatever value it has. It's not somebody else's responsibility. If I'm responsible for somebody else's sufferings or whatever, then they're responsible for mine. But they're living in ignorance. Haven't we just established that? They're living in ignorance of, of their own suffering. How can I expect them to be receptive to my suffering? That works both ways. If I'm responsible for their suffering, they're living in ignorance of their own suffering. Why do I have to be aware of what they're not aware of when they're the one who's perceiving it? When they're the one who's experiencing it? People are ignorant, or they're not. Um, at least ignorant of their own experience. And that's, again, that's Nietzsche's dichotomy between belief and knowledge. What is it that he says? If you want a good life and joy and contentment and everything, then believe. Believe in hope, I guess. Believe what you want to believe in your own mythology and hope that you never have those blinkers violently taken off without you actually understanding that it's happening. If you want knowledge, forgo all of that and stare straight into the face of reality. <laughs>